Hello, this is Sam Connell, and I'm going to talk about my impressions about Chinese children's literature, drawing from my experiences at the 2018 Bologna Children's Book Fair, as well as my own research into the history of Chinese children's literature. What's really interesting to me is the ways in which China is deeply tied to its history. Like any other nation with an extensive and tumultuous history, there's a strong push to both embrace, but also to distance itself from the past. Children's picture books are, relative, are a relatively new phenomenon in China as compared to the rest of the world. Modern Chinese children's picture books are inextricably tied to this history, but it is powerfully influenced by modern economics and politics. It's important to understand these influences if you seek to understand today's Chinese um, children's picture books. The Cultural Revolution was a socio-political movement from 1966 to about 1976 and it left an indelible mark on art and creative works, including children's picture books. To provide some context, in 1966 through 1976, the Caldecott winners included Sylvester and the Magic Pebble and One Fine Day. When we look at the books being published in English in the late 60s, the contrast is staggering. Um, we have uplifting tales with anthropomorphized animals. Leo Leone was celebrating poetry in a lazy mouse. And Minerick and Sendak write and illustrate with a carefree and exuberant warmth. <clears throat> Researchers that address the influence of the Cultural Revolution on Chinese children's books note the restrictions placed on this discipline and the fear of repercussions. If we are looking back to the history of Chinese children's literature, we cannot ignore the influence of this era on modern day literature. In 2015, the Comparative Literature Studies Journal published a special issue about global Maoism and the writer An Feng Shen submitted a critical review about Chinese children's literature during China's Cultural Revolution and he directly addresses the dearth of quality literature due to political and um, governmental influence. It's often believed that the government neglected Chinese children's literature during this time, but the opposite is true. There was a lot of attention paid to children's literature, but it was very tightly controlled and censored. Literary works produced during the Cultural Revolution were always politically oriented. We don't have the childlike perspective that we value so much in American children's literature. The works from this era always are keep, keep, that they always keep in mind the class struggle and the struggle for the proletarian revolutionary cause. Writers were strictly controlled, monitored, and directed, so they couldn't write according to children's needs or their interests. And writers that challenged the political guidelines were criticized or um, even fired, some were imprisoned and persecuted. Political persecution was a real threat, and in some ways it still is today. During the Cultural Revolution, writers could not write in accordance with the principles of literary artistry or to the natural mentality of children as they observed them. They had to be very, very sensitive to governmental and political climate. The publications addressing children were considered an important way to influence the public. So we see a deeply rooted historical system of didactic works for children. The form was very different from the way Western worlds and the English language publishers and consumers viewed quality children's literature. The works from this era, um, it's obviously contrived and we have an author here that wrote a book about the history of aesthetics and politics in 20th century China, and he sees the work as ritualistic and theatrical. 
it has a lasting effect on character development, story arcs, and even the way parents choose books. And we can see the effect of the cultural revolution today. It makes sense that there is still a strong tie to these ideas. While we've moved away from Marxist ideas of class and economics, the obvious value of the spirit of this mid-century was in the raising of children universally. There are currently over 200 Red Army schools in China today, and Chinese literature is still deeply enmeshed in conformist ideas of filial piety and views of being hardworking and obedient. While I was at the Bologna's Children Book Fair, I had the privilege of listening in on a panel about Chinese children's literature and uh, emerging trends. And this is where I was first introduced to Dr. Fang Wei Ping. He was a well-regarded children's book critic. He's the Dean of Children's Cultural Research Institute and the Director of the Children's Literature Institute at Zhejiang Normal University. He views 1978 as a turning point in Chinese children's literature. The symposium was a gathering of over 200 writers and translators, publishers, theoretical workers, organizers, and government officials. They gathered in October of 1978 basically because they were so dissatisfied by, by the state of Chinese children's books. Dr. Fang regards the Lushan Symposium as the great turning point in Chinese children's literature. This symposium was a cross-section of writers and publishers, and it really sought to uh, come up with a framework and a plan to develop Chinese children's literature. What is noteworthy about this is the full support of the government. Not unlike the Cultural Revolution, again, we see the involvement of the government. The Chinese literature is very much married to this support of the government. The progress was not easy. Dr. Fang sees the years following the 1978 Lushan Symposium as years of bewilderment. Remember that the government dictated the arts throughout the Cultural Revolution, and here the government is again dictating a movement forward. And though authors were encouraged to um, be comparable to the types of literature and award-winning works from other countries, authors were very unsure about what that meant. Uh, what were they allowed to do? And um, there were a lot of questions. A lot of these questions can only be resolved after works are published and if censorship follows. So there was a lot of concern about what, if anything, uh, you could say in a ch child's book with impunity. Even so, the results of the Lushan Symposium were almost immediate. With the support of the Chinese government, we see a real growth and a new kind of creativity in Chinese children's literature. Uh, publishers grew from two to 20. Newspapers and journals for children's readers increased and historical journals record the number of children's writers from 200 to about 3,000 within six years following the symposium. The growth is very much tied to economics even today. So for years, Chinese publishers translated children's literature from abroad. And there's a real recognition that there's a market for children's pictures book within China. And that now, more than ever, we see that people have the disposable income to spend on children's books. So we're really trying to shift um, from importing and translating award-winning books from uh, the West to the government saying, we want to grow our own children's literature. With the backing of the Chinese government, the Renaissance is real. The government supports the children's book industry and it leads to a partnership with publishers. And we see uh, a growth in, in awards and awareness. And this creates a real space for authors and artists to grow, explore, and thrive.
Many Chinese children's literature awards, like the Bingxing and the Song Qingling, now appear to be defunct. But other awards, like the Chen Bo Choi, are gaining momentum, and new awards, like the Fang Zi Kai, have really gained prestige. So when you look at um, outstanding children's literature, we're really looking at the 80s and a growth through the last 15 years. And now the Fang Zikai is considered comparable to the American's Caldecott, which for comparison began in 1938. China has increased the presence and visibility, not only with increased awards, but really in their support for the rights fairs. And they do this really through their largest publishers. The Shanghai International Children's Book Fair was established in 2013, and they announced their partnership with the Bologna Fair at uh, the 2018 Bologna Children's Book Fair, where they were in fact the guest of honor. And so being the guest of honor, they were able to really showcase their, their best writers and illustrators, their emerging talent, and also their, their publishing houses, both big, massive, and small. Um, at the Bologna Fair, they did announce this partnership. And so with this partnership, they're hoping to add the experience and expertise in the international network of contacts and hoping to recreate in Shanghai what they see in terms of the magnitude of copyright trading, cultural exchange, exhibitions, awards, and conferences that we see uh, today in the Bologna Fair. So amongst the uh, works that have come across to the United States, we see that uh, their very famous author, Chao Wenchuan, which we studied this semester, Dr. Fang considers him to be the most representative writer in Chinese children's literature. Uh, he wrote Bronze and Sunflower, as well as Feather, in collaboration with Roger Mello. We also have what I'm putting in quotations, a translated illustrator, which is which basically means a book that's made it across and it's published in the United States. A New Year's Reunion by Yu Li Qiong um, is, is incredible. The illustrator here, um, I've studied and I actually wrote about at length in my paper. It, it, he has such a, a powerful and subtle way of telling a sub story uh, beyond what you read in the text. If, if you look carefully at the images, you'll notice just very subtle and powerful tactics. Uh, a little girl's foot just outside an enclosed threshold, uh, which really resonates as her uh, crossing a threshold into understanding her parents' struggle. The, the subtle way that the mother holds her hands to her face and she's, she's so sad and grieving over her husband, who's a migrant worker, who's leaving. And the way the, the suitcase uh, echoes the, the shapes of the father and the way the colors, the color white, uh, throughout the book just supports this idea of warmth and family uh, and, and the way the color red is celebratory. But um, anyway, Zhu Qingliang is one of my favorite illustrators and I, I hope you get a chance to look at this and, and use a careful eye to notice the symbolism and powerful use of color. So, what was most valuable to me in approaching the International Children's Book Fair was this access to books beyond the wall. From my computer here in the United States, I can glimpse what these books were like, and I could see a few um, images, and I could read synopses, um, but it's really difficult unless you can get to an international book fair, and then you're able to touch these books and flip through them and read them, and it was not only did I fall madly for certain books, but I was also able to dismiss certain books that I thought I, uh, would be fabulous. So anyway, here's a, here's a gathering of a couple of books that I just hope make it across the wall and get published in English. So let's, well, let's start with the author and the illustrator that we've already talked about. Um, Chao Wenchuan will be 
uh, publishing another collaboration with Roger Mello, which is this die cut book. Um, and it's, it's incredible. It's called Lemon Butterfly here in the lower right. There's also a book called Summer, which seems to be an uproarious celebration with animals, it's a little bit of a departure from his very reserved uh, illustrations in feather. Zhu Liang, who was the illustrator from a New Year's reunion, has published this book and it's about a grandmother dreaming and not being able to fall asleep and she's counting sheep. It's, it's beautifully illustrated, but uh, my thinking here is that I really hope this book makes it to American shores and we can see the way this fabulous illustrator is evolving. And the style here is just so different from what we saw in his previous works. So the contrast of the past and present. So there's these emerging voices and trends that I've noticed. Uh, we're definitely shifting away from didactic tales to a child's point of view. There's still a lot of folk tale that's revered um, and a lot of the folk tale is done with different types of artists. Um, but there's also unique stories and they really show an irreverence and a playfulness that is um, very much from a child's point of view. We also see an emphasis of the illustrators as an artist, uh, it very much celebrated, and we see the pride that the Chinese have in their children's book illustrators. We see some really beautiful nonfiction coming out of China and a sense of luxury. There are books that clearly are expensive, not only to produce, but also to purchase. We see die cut books, books with center opening flaps, all sorts of interesting shapes that um, we can see that there's and artistry is prioritized over cost, which is pretty exciting. Um, but I will say, I also was looking for a, an emerging voice of individualism. Um, initially, I was reading a few books and I thought maybe we were headed in that direction. I couldn't really find publishers that wanted to talk to me about that. And while I saw hints of this in books, this is sort of this is sort of the holy grail I couldn't capture. I, I do think it's out there. I, I need to find and read more of these books and see where we're headed, but this is something that's probably, I sense emerging in young adult books. And so that's gonna require a little bit more digging and finding and reading. So hopefully I will, I will, I will eventually track that down and see if that's actually happening the way that I sense it it might be. So irreverent books from a child's perspective there's um, you know a pig that's late and and this is this is really fascinating to me this is a book about a child with a pimple and all of the creative ways that this child uh, tries to disguise and or embrace the pimple on her nose. Um, illustrators as revered artists. We, we got to see a lot of illustrator competitions in Bologna, small ones and big ones, local ones, emerging artists, as well as celebrations of established artists. One of the best parts of the Bologna book fair was um, an extensive art gallery of established illustrators that are really making their mark right now in Chinese children's picture books. We were lucky enough to have Carolina Ballister. Um, she's an international program manager at CCBF, and she brought us through and talked to us quite a bit about uh, just how exciting illustrators in China um, and, and the, um, the effort to promote them has been. So here's an illustrator that is, um, I don't know if you can tell from this picture, but combining embroidery with painting which are two very traditional Chinese skills. Um, and here we see a lot of the reverend artists are, are, are drawing and illustrating with very traditional Chinese techniques. Um, and I absolutely love this artist. What I love is that 
the the art is not ostensibly Asian in terms of technique, but there's just a hint of it. And here the artist is using traditional Ming Dynasty vases, and that's what he's used to depict animals. Uh, we we do have gorgeous block cuts and block printing, as well as very um, detailed watercolors. This is a, a nonfiction art author, and this book won the Fang Zikai, the most recent Fang Zikai award winner, and she did an incredible job. She actually lived with a village for two years to study the process of actually growing and harvesting rice. So there's so much really interesting things going on in illustrations, but what is also really nice is the investment into this um, uh, genre. So here we see books that are extremely unusual. We have a we have a, a shape that is is I would assume difficult and probably expensive to produce, but it creates this really incredible in this book about a fish in the ocean, a, a very very. Uh, wide landscape view and these beautiful pencil drawings. We also have um, uh, the lemon butterfly, as I mentioned on the far right, which is the Roger Mello Chow Wen Chun most recent collaboration is a die cut book and you can lift the pages off the book in an accordion fold and it actually um, it's reminiscent of a butterfly uh, or groups of butterflies fluttering. And on the bottom, there's a book that's read from both the right and the left. And as a nod towards traditional reading of a Chinese book from the right to the left and from the Western of reading from the left to right, this book is a story about nomadic herders, one was being cows and the other being horses, and they meet in the middle. And as you can see in the very lower right, the, the book opens up in the middle into this multicolor feast where both tribes get together and celebrate. And then on the far left, there's also a book about uh, a child who's blind, uh, and then you discover that he's not. But it's a book that really addresses this idea of disability in kids. But similar to the book about the horses and the, and the cows that meet in the middle, there's this beautiful central spread that opens up. Um, and, and while we're on that topic, just a quick aside is the Chinese are doing a great job in addressing children's books with uh, uh, disabilities. Here's a uh, blind little red writing here that also got a lot of attention. Um, so that's it. I just wanted to give everyone a, a, a great overview about the fantastic books that I've seen. There's really not enough time to go through all of the things that I fell in love with and I will try to put more details in the uh, the clash shell but that's just an overview of my amazing Bologna experience as well as some research I did to understand what it was that everybody was referring to in terms of the 1978 the, the big turning and turning point so um, I hope you enjoyed it I will put my work cited up so that you can uh, read some of these really great articles that I've read. And um, I hope you enjoyed Bologna as much as I did. Thank you, and bye.